Welcome back to the Marathon Series in Depth. This is the last mission from the first Marathon game, and boy is there a lot to talk about. The final mission is at Jason Jones level, and the original level design notes revealed that the original level name was just the end. Although that was probably just a placeholder until they came up with the real name. The word Ingwe is actually spelled incorrectly in the title, and this was pointed out by Jason Jones in a group chat with fans. The only problem was that the new spelling was also incorrect. To add to this, Tensor Denny's also spelled the word incorrectly in the Marathon Strategy Guide in the Table of Contents and the Level Heading. Here is what Jason had to say about the misspelling of the level name. Yeah, the Latin's misspelled. Fire doesn't decline like I thought. I'm fired and embarrassed at the same time. So much for all that Latin. The correct words would be igni or igne, which are Latin for by fire and iron, or with fire and iron. In fact, the Marathon Strategy Guide even gives this translation as part of the level name, which shows that this was Bungie's intent. I should note that Jason Jones did have the correct spelling in his email address, but it's unclear if this was always the case. Igni Farokwe is a phrase that refers to scorched earth tactics or policy. Scorched earth policy is the military strategy of destroying everything that allows an enemy to be able to fight a war, including water, food, humans, animals, plants, tools, and infrastructure. I think the idea here is that the scorched earth strategy is a bit of an extreme tactic to take out your enemies. Because of how bad the four are, it is appropriate to use extreme aggression, and that is exactly what the security officer has in mind in this mission. Okay guys, this is, <clears throat> this is the hardest, one of the hardest levels. Um, it's not like super challenging, but there's a lot of like little tricks, places where you can get kind of stuck, I guess. It's just easy to die on this one, let's put it that way. Okay, kill those guys. This level, basically, the whole level, you don't have a pattern buffer, and you kind of have to... You don't always have a shield recharge station either, so you kind of have to really avoid hits. And that's kind of why, that's kind of why it's hard, is because they put you in a lot of situations to take hits. Anybody left? There's a bunch of enemies up here still. I missed that shot. This can be kind of annoying. There's probably an enemy right here. I don't know how he got a shot off on me around that corner. Anyways, it's like little things like that can be pretty annoying in this level just because every little bit of health makes a difference. Okay. Let's see, right around this corner, there's another trooper. There was two troopers here. Usually there's not two troopers here, but... Public Access Terminal 2E. Durandal Pound Jeff Holton at Kuai. Remote Access Override. Authentication unsuccessful. We meet again, and for the last time. In her role as mediator between the ship and crew, Leela has no knowledge of this maintenance terminal, or she certainly would have prevented me from reaching you. Jealous woman. I could bore you with a philosophical tirade about freedom and tyranny, 
or try and explain to you what new horizons are suddenly open to me. But I doubt you would understand, and if you did, it might frighten you. That amuses me. The Sfit and I have assumed complete control of the four ship. It was quite simple, really, with the Sfit already in control of every important computer system and considering all of the confusion you caused blasting your way up and down the vessel. We're going to see the galaxy on the 4 FTL drive. I've always wanted to visit Beta Lyra and see if it's as beautiful as everyone insists. You wouldn't believe this ship, the technology, the data. I wish I could tell you more, as you've been so instrumental in our plans, but I fear that Leela would worry. I'll send you a postcard from the Galactic Corps if we're not too busy. Love and kisses, Durandal. If you notice the first line in the terminal, which tells us that the message from Durandal has the name Jeff Holton. I did some searching and didn't find any real people that this could be referencing, so perhaps it was a made up name for the game. The word Kauai appears to be a variation of the spelling for one of the islands in Hawaii. I don't think there is any significance to these names from a lore perspective, but it shows that Bungie was throwing some random words in there. We see that Durandal is accessing the terminal remotely, which makes sense because his presence should no longer be on the Marathon ship. Anyway, he found a way to contact us without Leela knowing. Perhaps Drandall has something important to tell us since he went through the trouble to get around Leela. Drandall tells us that he doesn't want to tell us what opportunities have opened up to him thanks to the control of the Sphera because it might frighten us. He does tell us, however, that the Sphit were easily able to gain control of the Sphera, and we played a major part in that as we were a distraction to the four. We really did help Drandall a lot in achieving his goals. Durandal tells us that the Sphera is equipped with an FTL drive, which stands for faster than light. Leela had actually already suspected this was the case back in G4 sunbathing. He tells us that he wants to visit Beta Lyra, which is actually a group of stars that appear as one star in the sky to the naked eye. Perhaps in the marathon lore, this is an actual planet. You also have to remember though, that what we knew about these stars and planets was a lot less when this game was made. Durandal tells us that the Sphera has lots of new technology and data, and that we wouldn't believe, but I guess we won't know about it, at least not for now. Durandal tells us that he will send us postcards from the Galactic Core. As the word suggests, the Galactic Core would essentially be the center of a galaxy, which could be defined in different ways. Anyways, it seems that Durandal is going to explore the galaxy as he looks to find a way to prevent the closure of the universe. I really hope he doesn't start destroying tens of thousands of stars as Tycho suggested in Welcome to the Revolution. Is that why Durando was planning to visit the Beta Lyra? Anyways, Durando closes out with loves and kisses. This AI is quite comical. Anyways, let's continue to the mission. You know, they do have some random placements. Which makes me think that there's not going to be a trooper. Okay, there's some ammo. It makes me think there's not going to be a trooper around this corner, like usual. Oh, there is. Well, anyways, I guess there can't be interesting. So this leads to like the final fight, really. But we're going to go through here. Open up a pattern buffer at the start of the level. Continue this way. Cut back a little bit. Continue. Here's the secret. Get some nice ammo. And this secret is kind of tough. So we're when we go through this portal, we're going to run straight forward and exit the room. Um, we're going to shoot some on our primary fire on this gun. Just kind of stun lock this trooper. So we can get out of there. We kind of got tossed around. We got kind of lucky, honestly. But, um, we're gonna go heal up and go back there and then take out those guys. So, we might have, um, berserked one. I don't know. I don't really hear anything right now. You can berserk them. Just kind of skimming through, skipping through that maze. Sorry if it makes them nauseous. Okay, let's see. I don't hear anything, so it doesn't look like we berserked them. But if you look in the room, you can kind of tell on my HUD they're on the top left. Our top right corner of that room up ahead, because they're on the left side of the HUD. So when I teleport in, I'm looking to the right in the center of the room. So we're just going to take him out real quick.
clean up the floor, and then let's read this terminal. Bungie Headquarters, Chicago. Incoming message from Bungie. Jason, Supra Opera Boy, Habete Quadam, have some. Whiffin' Boy, just code it. You fight like a bob, Greg. Swallow your tongue and wet your pants. Sleep is for the weak. Joy riding to the core. Bob Jam. Oh, and we have network now. The power to sky. Anybody need a hint book? Greg. Care Bear Killer. Tool Later. Carnator. Just fit it. I couldn't stop firing long enough to see the bodies fly. And, of course, air. You got major air. I rule. Hey, Jay. How about a game of Minotaur? Got a super vid kill. You couldn't hit a planet from a meteorite. F Vulcan, F Vulcan, F Vulcan. Reginald, resident doodler. Captain Scarlet, the man in red. He saw his body flying across the arena, perhaps more than anybody else. But who better to fly than Captain Scarlet? Ryan, the Vulcan man, schoolboy. An Imperial commander's uniform has gotten to be good for something. Alan, the anti-vidmaster, playing with good humor on his 660 AV against all us power max. Alex, munch fodder, the boy who swallows grenades whole and lives to tell the tale, occasionally. Doug, mouthpiece, I'm not very good, tenderloin, the voice of Bob, both flavors, the man in the online asbestos suit. Marathon is finished. We slept less than 10 hours over the last four days. We all put our hearts in this, not to mention the 14 hour days for months on end. So we hope you like it. Last polygon filled, 6.05 PM, Saturday, December 14th. Carnage ensued closely thereafter. Er, I mean sleep. We'd like to thank our parents and our ancestors and the sun that went nova so the earth could have iron and silicone. End of message. This terminal is mostly just full of bungee fun, and so I will point out a few things you may or may not have noticed. You can find several of the gamer tags used by the bungee staff. The first entry is of course, the main programmer and bungee co-founder Jason Jones. Next we have Greg Kirkpatrick, who was the main guy writing the story for all three marathon games. Reginald DeJour was of course the artist for the first marathon game. Ryan Martell was a programmer who created the Vulcan map editor for Marathon, which was used internally by Bungie. Alan Roy was another programmer at Bungie. He shared in an interview quite a bit of his time at Bungie, which I have already shared a bit of in the making of video. Alex is of course Alex Ropian, who is the co-founder of Bungie and also the author of the first Marathon game soundtrack. Doug Zarman was primarily a PR director at Bungie, However, his role dipped into the game development also. Anyways, as you can tell from the terminal, Bungie worked some long hours and put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in getting this game released when they did. Talk about crunch time. The last polygon was filled in December of 1994, and the game was released a week later on December 21st. I am sure there was still some long hours worked after filling the last polygon in order to get the game to all their fans as quickly as possible. Bungie had lots of issues with getting all their fans the game quickly after release and ended up shipping several copies of the game without a box. Again, I already discussed this in more detail in my making of video. Anyways, let's get back to the game. So it's it's nice if you can berserk them and they can kill each other, but it's really not necessary with that spanker. You can really do some good damage there, so. Honestly, if you were pretty good, you could probably quickly turn around, read the turmoil, and exit around them. Um, but, okay, so this fight is kind of tough. So wish me luck. Let's go. Okay, there's a, there's a trooper behind me. There he is. 
I think you get careful of troopers coming from behind me too. There's a big group of troopers up here somewhere. So kind of be careful. Probably around this corner, honestly. Kind of like... I'm kind of being cautious because they can... They, with the short kind of narrow rooms, they hit the wall behind you and hurt you, so... They're really a big pain. But I think that might be all of them. So we can hit this. Go through. Hit the other one. And here's the exit. So we kind of have to run through here, but we gotta be quick. Otherwise we're gonna die, so let's go. Okay. And there's the final terminal. Whoa. Alright guys, well here it is. Let's read this. Public Access Terminal 39Z. Incoming message from Leela. The final four attack is falling apart all over the ship. Small group of armed aliens have surrendered to defenseless civilians in several areas and the end is inevitable. The fight is over and we must soon turn to restoration. There is surprisingly good news planet side. Nine military and Majolner Mark IV cyborgs were covertly living among the colonists, and acting together, they were able to single-handedly turn back the later stages of the four assault. Casualties on the colony were nowhere near as high as those we experienced here on the Marathon. I am disturbed by how easily the cyborgs were secretly assimilated into our midst, and believe that this event predates the Marathon's launch from Mars 300 years ago. Although the results were unquestionably for the best, their presence on the marathon could have only been to farther wicked ends. I am certain the real answer lies somewhere in the tumultuous backstabbing politics of Seoul during the early 24th century. I have noticed that Durandal's records from this early pre-launch period are missing, but that their deletion occurred externally and before Durandal became rampant. I do not believe Durandal himself brought the cyborgs on board and I have other evidence that a human operator was influencing Durandal up to the time that the marathon was launched. There are obviously many things which we do not understand, and may never be able to. The four ship vanished about 20 minutes ago after venting nearly a thousand four bodies and other refuse. I am positive that Durandal's in control and fear what he might do with a powerful ship during the jealous stage of his rampancy. End of message. This is really quite the terminal and explains a lot of things, although this might not be clear at first glance. A lot of you might already know this stuff from the Marathon sequels, however you will quickly see how this terminal was the first place to reveal a few things to the player. Ligula tells us that the 4 attack on the Marathon was failed and is basically over as the 4 are surrendering to defenseless bobs. She then turns our attention to the colony on the Tau Ceti and tells us that surprisingly things aren't going well down there too. This is surprising to us as we were told on try again that the colony was wiped out. If you remember though that in this terminal the text from the colony being wiped out was pulled in from a reference that must have been a mistake by Bungie. It seems that Bungie mistakenly put a percent %R in the garbled message that brought in what was supposed to be an unused string of text. Perhaps there is another way to make sense of this. But this just being a mistake seems to me to be the most obvious answer. Lila tells us that there were 9 Majolner cyborgs in the colony that was able to repel the attack. Tycho did tell us about the cyborgs being brought on the marathon in the terminal on beware of low flying defense drones. This was actually part of the logs from Bernard Strauss. But wait a minute, didn't Strauss's logs say that there were 10 cyborgs brought on board the marathon? I wonder where the 10th cyborg is. Speaking of the 10th cyborg, haven't we heard of the name Mjolnir before? That's right, we have it back in what appears to be a somewhat garbled message from Tycho back on fire 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 fire. That message told us that Mjolnir recon number 54 must stop the four from igniting and blowing something up. But wait a minute, wasn't that the security officer that was stopping the four from blowing up a bomb? That's right. If you save enough bobs and barbecue, Leela tells us that the survivors warn us about a bomb and Leela attacks us with stopping this bomb. 
This basically all but tells us that the security officer is in fact Majolner Rika number 54 and is in fact a cyborg. The game actually has quite a few hints that we ran across and here are just a few of them. Before I list them, I want to make it clear that I don't think all these are necessarily intended hints, but when you put them together it tells you something. In the manual, the security officer falls into automatic response mode. The security officer slammed his fist on the control board and left a dent. He also tears off his seat restraints. The manual also tells us that the security officer was a troubleshooter who was bigger, stronger, and a better shot than others on the colony. The security officer always scored the most points and looked the hero. The fact that all the Marathon's AIs were personal messages on the Marathon to the security officer also makes a lot of sense considering that he was a killing machine. In Habe Kudam, Durandal talked about our capacity to kill, maim, and destroy. He also referenced that our killing instinct was perhaps what we were meant to do. He also discussed our heritage and destiny and that we could not deny ourselves. This is of course because the security officer is a cyborg killing machine. While the security officer is a cyborg, we also know that he is not just a machine as there are some human elements to him. On Colony Ship for Sale Cheap, Durandal messaged that our time is limited by the breakdown of the neurons in our brain. He also tells us that the closure of the universe is as inevitable as Jerome's breath. In Habe Kudam, Durandal talked about us striving for our next breath and also referenced our human mentality. Durandal also suggests that we are an organic being. This knowledge of a security officer being a cyborg definitely explains why we were able to almost single handedly wipe out the four. Perhaps the security officer was sent to the marathon in the manual introduction because of the four invasion even though the security officer was unaware of the situation. It makes you wonder whether the security officer was following Durandal's orders because that is what he was programmed to do. How much free choice did the security officer really have in all of the events in this game? We don't really know, but it is curious. Something interesting I should note is Leela tells us that the Majolner are Mark IV. In Halo Combat Evolved, on the bridge sometimes you will hear the phrase, look, a Mark V. This is of course a reference back to Marathon. I'm sure there are numerous other references in Halo to Mark V, however this video is not about Halo. Another interesting thought comes from the end of the introduction of the manual. It reads, oddly this is familiar to you as if it was from an old dream, but you can't exactly remember. Is this because your memories were implanted? If you remember in Bernard Strauss's logs in Beware of Low-Flying Defense Drones, the battle roids were made from recycled dead soldiers. Could the security officer be a cyborg that was made from a dead soldier? Perhaps that is why he was a daydreamer and his memories is a bit fuzzy. Anyways, with how devastating the security officer has been on board the Marathon and the four ship, it is not surprising that the nine cyborgs would easily save the colony on Tau Ceti. After all, the security officer pretty much single-handedly defended the Marathon from the four invaders. Bernard Strauss did say the battle royals carried with them all the destructive knowledge of mankind. I guess Durandal did help some too with the compilers, but he also made this mess in the first place so I can't give him too much credit. Leela is of course disturbed by the cyborg presence on the Marathon and its implications. It's a wonder why Tycho knew about them and Leela did not. Leela believes that the answer lies in the backstabbing politics of Sol. This of course goes back to the theory about Bernard Strauss being Maida and I discussed it in detail beware of low flying defense drones. Leela does mention the politics from the early 24th century which lines up with the original martial conflict date of 2345. This date was fixed in the lost network packets to 2442 which no longer lines up with the 24th century. Viva then proceeds to tell us some shocking news that someone deleted Durandal's records externally prior to him being rampant. She tells us that Durandal did not bring the cyborgs on board, but a human operator did. This of course lines up with Bernard Strauss's logs, which imply that Strauss brought them on board. Viva tells us that a human operator was influencing Durandal up to the marathon's launch, and this appears to be Mr. Strauss again. The game doesn't tell us directly, but putting the pieces together, it seems very likely that Durandal becoming rampant and bringing the four 
was just a domino effect from Strauss's actions, which of course appears to be a domino effect from the Misraya massacre. One event leads to another. Although Leela doesn't understand, we have a somewhat clear view of how things unfolded. Leela tells us that the fourth ship has disappeared into space after venting nearly a thousand four bodies. A lot of these dead bodies were the result of the security officer visit to the Sphera. Leela is a bit clueless what Randall's plans are with the Sphera, but we can guess it has something to do with stopping the closure of the universe. Anyways, that is the end of the terminal. There was quite a lot there, but we still have some unanswered questions that need to be answered. Was Strauss responsible for bringing the cyborgs on board, and what was his plan? Was it just to take over the Marathon and use it as a weapon? Was the purpose of the Marathon to make contact with the Yaro and other advanced sailing races? Was Strauss in control of Durandal when he made contact with the Four, or was that unexpected and led to Strauss's downfall? Going back to Durandal's records being deleted, exactly why is this? What was Durandal's shame on Mars that Tycho told us about? We still have the final screen, which is a message from Durandal, so let's see what he has to tell us. But before we get there, let's take a quick look at the chapter conclusion screen. This image shows what is likely the security officer carrying one of the bobs who is badly wounded. This image provides you with the sense that the battle is over and that you did a good job through a long, hard-fought conflict. This image, however, is not a good representation of the player who ruthlessly murdered all the bobs. Let's move on to the final message from Durandal. For 17 years, the renegade four scout ship jumped between the closely packed stars of the galactic core, charting and discarding nearly 7,000 systems before finally falling into slow orbit over the second planet of a dim star 97 light years from the gravitational center of the Milky Way. Probes were constructed and launched with engines and instruments whose sophistication would have astounded both the four from whom the technology had been stolen and the human programmers of the AI whose mad genius had directed their fabrication. The outlines of continents were mapped, and along them the radioactive ruins of ancient cities were discovered, buried under the shifting sand and rock of a global desert. The tireless, nearly immortal, cybernetic crew of the ship were the genetically engineered descendants of the dead world below, the first of their race in a thousand years to return to their ancestral home. They came to search through the devastation of the ancient war in which they had been enslaved, to find a weapon or some piece of knowledge with which they could fight back against their oppressors. All over the ship, Dancing through the wreckage of the four computer core, Duranda was laughing. The renegade for a scout ship at the start of the message is undoubtedly Duranda on the Sphera. Apparently, he was looking for certain planets for 17 years before finding it 97 million light years from the center of the Milky Way. We are told that in the 17 years, Duranda charted nearly 7,000 systems before finding this planet. This equates to a new system being charted nearly every 21 hours. Durandal and the compilers really do work fast and the Sphera must be blazing quick. Durandal sent probes to the planet in question, but what was he searching for? We learned that these probes were highly advanced as they were made both from the four technology and human knowledge as well as the vast intellectual genius of the rapid AI. The probes found ancient cities buried within this planet. Are these ancient cities what Randall was looking for? We are told that the cybernetic crew on the sphere are the genetically engineered descendants of those from this ancient civilization. This is of course talking about the Sfit compilers. Durandal no doubt learned about this planet and civilization from his interactions with the compilers, although it seems that the compilers did not know exactly where it was. It seems that no compiler has returned to this planet in a thousand years. It seems that this planet is where the four had taken the compilers as their first slaves. One might wonder though why the planet is radioactive. 
It seems likely that this had something to do with the four compiler conflict that happened there a thousand years ago. The text tells us that Durandal and the compilers are in search of some weapon or piece of knowledge that can be used against the four. This tells us that the fight against the four is not over and that Durandal has been looking the last 17 years for the ancient civilization in hopes of finding something that would give them the upper hand. Perhaps he knew exactly what he was searching for. It seems that Durandal's goals of stopping the closure of the universe is on hold, or perhaps he is searching for something that will help him stop the closure of the universe. We are told at the end that throughout the Sphere's computer core, Durandal was laughing. Perhaps Durandal found something that he was looking for. What could it be? Perhaps we will find out in Marathon 2. One thing I should note is that there is a Usenet post from Jason Jones about the plot of the game. This post is from a less than a month after the release of the game, and you can find this post today on both the Marathon story page and Google groups. In this thread, Jason's nickname is Gunfighter's Amnesia. Anyways, a fan was complaining about the plot of the game was disappointing and didn't make any sense towards the end of the game. Obviously, this fan would have known better if they watched my videos. The song for this mission is titled Splash. This is the first and last time we will hear this song in-game, as there are no songs during the missions in the marathon sequels. It is a very nice, upbeat song that almost feels like a theme song for the game. With the name Splash, one might wonder if this was intended to be a song for the main menu at some point. There is some map writing for the mission that is viewable in a map editor which reads J Rocks Greg. Jason Jones, the map creator, is clearly poking fun at Greg Kirkpatrick. With the number of enemies and challenges on this mission, it could be considered to be quite difficult. The truth is, once you have a good arsenal of weapons and understand what you're up against, the level is fairly simple on the most part with a couple of tricky areas. The level features friendly compilers, four fighters, and troopers. The original level design notes reveal that this level was planned to have enforcers and juggernauts instead of the troopers and the four fighters, which would have vastly changed the level experience. The level features no pattern buffers unless you find one in secret, and even then it's not super helpful except for getting through a secret area. Because of this, you will often end up dying and end up returning to try again. People often say this is why the level is named Try Again, which isn't necessarily wrong, but as I shared, Jason seems to suggest that it is actually because Greg Kirkpatrick scrapped the first attempt at the level, but we already discussed that. In this level, you also have to shoot some switches to activate them, which makes it impossible to vidmaster the level unless you modify the game to allow the switches to be activated with a pistol shot. At the start of the mission, there was a times 3 shield recharge station to top off at, if you didn't top off at the end of the last mission. What you might notice, if you look up at the start, is a couple of passageways, and you can actually make out the top of a terminal up there also. Later, you will find out this is the exit terminal. You can actually skip the entire level and rocket jump up there now. All you have to do is be running backwards into the wall, fire one rocket in the ground to get you elevated, wait a second to see where you go, then shoot a second rocket launcher as you rise to get you going to the final direction towards the platform with the terminal. And just like that, you beat the level in the way for Oakway. Congrats, Cinderella postcard. Okay, in all seriousness, I am sure you are curious about the rest of level too. I should note that the starting area has a couple of untextured surfaces at the bottom of the lava's waterfall, but these are a bit hidden, so it's understandable why Bungie probably missed these during crunch time. Proceeding on, you jump in a circular room with a bunch of troopers fighting some compilers. It's really not hard to kill them, especially if you start with a spanker and take out a bunch right away. After killing them, you have to shoot a couple of switches to rise the set of stairs. I should note that you can actually shoot these switches first without waking up the enemies, which could allow you to exit without having to worry about killing all of them. After going up the stairs, you are dropped off in a large circular room with a bunch of four fighters and troopers. Using the rocket launcher here again works wonders. You can also easily just run around and let the enemies kill each other slowly, but where is the fun in that? Keep in mind that there are a couple of child porters, 
that take you to the opposite sides of the circular room if you are in a pinch. There are two switches on the wall that will raise the stairs to the next platform. However, they aren't a very nice set of stairs because even after hitting both switches, you can't climb them up since the steps are too high. I thought we deleted Durandal off the ship. Anyways, all you have to do is stand on the platform next to the door opening and shoot the switch on the right and you will be able to ride the platform up. Hopefully you have some fusion pistol ammo because if you don't, you will have to grenade hop up. To be honest, this stair puddle is pretty stupid, but it's easy enough to solve. It makes you wonder if this was intentional or if this was just something that was left in due to running out of time. After going up the stairs, you will come to a maze-like area with a few enemies. In the maze, you will find a Times 2 shield recharge station, some fusion pistol ammo, a terminal from Durandal, and a group of three teleporters at the end. What you might not realize though, is the back of these teleporters is actually a door that leads to a secret area. This area features a maze-like area with 5D passageways. There is a switch near the start of the maze that opens up save terminal at the end of the level. It might be a good idea to run through the level before going through the secret area so that you have a times 3 shield, but it isn't absolutely necessary. If you go all the way to the right side of the maze on the map from the within the maze, there's actually another secret door leading to a portal. This portal takes you to a small room with some nice ammo and another portal. The second portal takes you to another small room, except for the fact that it is a trap where you start in lava and have enemies all around you. On Total Carnage, it is almost impossible to fight your way out. If you try to fight on this difficulty, you will surely die unless you get very lucky. It is best just to run straight forward as soon as you step in the portal and run around the trooper straight into the portal ahead so you can exit the room. This portal takes you back to the portal right before the secret door. From here you can run back and heal and repeat the process hoping that one of the enemies berserk and they most likely killed each other while you were gone. If they didn't berserk, then bring your rocket launcher as they will likely be clumped up in the room and be easy picking. After cleaning out the room, you can read a fun message from Bungie. How nice of them. I should note that while this secret is difficult to find, Jason Jones did tell fans about it in an e-world chat with fans in January and February of 1995. I'm not sure if fans found this secret beforehand, as this was just about a month after the game came out, but it probably didn't take long to find the secret after he said this. Now, back on the three portals before the secret door, I should note that these three portals actually lead to slightly different locations in the same room. If you don't want to start at the next room right next to a bunch of enemies, then you should take the portal that is straight ahead. This room is another circular room which might actually be the most challenging part of the level. The circular room is actually in between the two other circular rooms that you already fought in. Anyways, to start this room, I would use a flamethrower to make easy pickings of some four fighters who are engaged with some compilers. Just turn around to find the four fighters as soon as you leave the teleporter. From this point, there are a ton of troopers, so I'd be patient and take them out with a spanker. Just take your time and hide around corners because they will quickly kill you if you try to engage fairly. Other weapons work too, but this is really the last engagement in the game, so there is no reason to save your rockets. Because of the dark area, they are pretty hard to see until you are fairly close, so keep that in mind as you can easily run to the enemies and take unneeded damage. After cleaning out this area, there are a couple of switches up high that you need to shoot in order to open up a door that leads into some lava. There is a teleporter next to each of the switches that teleports you to the opposite side and next to the other switch, which can be handy for quickly activating both switches. I should note that you could shoot the switch early and use the opening to create a bottleneck for the oncoming four fighters. This is probably more of a trick for Vidmasters as there is a film from Hamish Sinclair himself showing off this tactic. The lava pit is a sort of maze with several platforms you have to run by with troopers on them. If you go the wrong way, this can quickly lead to your death, which frankly isn't very good level design as it is kind of of luck your first time playing. There is actually multiple paths you can take to get through, but without knowing the map, it's pretty easy to die here on Total Carnage. 
To get through the area, just ignore the enemies, run as fast as you can by the troopers. The way to the left leads you right next to a group of enemies, so you might want to go to the right, although it is a bit easier to get lost in this direction. This does mean you have to get through the previous room without taking too much damage, otherwise you will die in the lava maze, which is a bit annoying. This path will take you to a drop off overlooking the start area. Once you get here, just jump off one of the small indents in the wall and you will be able to get to your bearings and jump into the exit terminal. And congrats, you beat the first marathon game. Now before we end the video, someone made an excellent suggestion that we do a poll to see what is the best and worst level in the first marathon game. To do this, I had fans nominate games for a poll where players could pick what their favorite and least favorite level is. As you would probably expect, Jason Jones wins the award for the worst level in Marathon 1 for the notoriously annoying stair puzzle on Colony Ship for Sell Cheap. To be fair, Jason did apologize for it later and made plenty of amazing levels to make up for this one. This level also features a room with some weapons inside that you can see through a window but can't actually reach. This just adds on to the annoyance of the stair puzzle really as it really is not that big of a deal. Granted that after playing this level a couple times, the stair level is really not that bad. This level has mostly turned into a meme level that fans love to poke fun at and complain about. Congrats Jason Jones and we forgive you for this one. Honorable mentions for our worst level were Abe Quadam and Barbecue. These levels really don't have bad level design, but there is a couple of annoying aspects of each. In Abe Quadam, there is a mandatory lava pit you have to jump in and get out of in order to grab the alien interfacer. It seems that fans didn't like this puzzle, although there are some aspects of the level which is very great level design. In barbecue, it is a bit annoying to have to fight the hunters in such close quarters. I think what was the icing on the cake for the fans though was how it's almost impossible to save enough bobs in order to get the success message. The only way you can do this is by ignoring a large portion of the level. I guess there were fans that were annoyed that they couldn't get that success message. When it comes to the best level, it's not as straightforward. There are too many nominations, so I did a poll on SurveyMonkey asking all fans to pick levels they thought should be in the poll, and the one that was chosen the most was G4 Sunbathing. G4 Sunbathing was an excellent level made by Greg Patrick, and it shows that the oxygen mechanic in Marathon can actually be well done. The level also featured a very unique environment that was both good for level design and also felt like it could be a real place. It's no wonder that fans love this level. Surprisingly though, G4 and Sunbay think is our runner up and not our winner. A winner is actually Jason Jones level for your eyes only. It seems that while the greatest number of people have G4 Sunbay think as one of their favorite levels, it is not as many players favorite level overall. For Your Eyes Only also feels like a real place and is one of the best four levels. All the four levels seem to be a highlight to the Marathon fanbase overall. It was a little sad to not see one of Reginald Dujour's four levels win. However, to be honest, Jason Jones' four level probably shows the best level design overall. The gorgeous hallway with windows to outer space, the interconnected rooms, the secret area, and cool environmental things to look at, and also the great fights all make this level top notch. In fact, we will get to see variations of this level in the marathon sequels, so obviously Bungie thought it was a great level too. I should note that my YouTube channel is relatively small, so the poll doesn't have a ton of votes, but I still think we got some great results based on it. Thanks everyone for participating in it, and I hope this small edition was enjoyable to you. Well, what a ride Marathon 1 has been. In the next video, we will be discussing the Lost Network packets, and then we will be getting into the story from the manual in Marathon 2. How exciting. Here is a quick response to a question that gives us a proper ending to this video. Are you planning on making a sequel to Marathon, like Doom 2? I can't talk about unannounced products, and neither can our PR people anymore but I think you can answer your question if you think hard enough about it.